Today I am going to walk you through picking the right Plex server to meet your needs, while also getting you the most bang for your buck. I will go over three different price ranges and Plex server sizes, small, medium, and large. I'll tell you what kind of performance you can expect from each of them, the power costs you should expect running them, and what limitations or caveats I found while making this video. designing and building a Plex server, you'll need to take a few things into consideration. Let's start with the logistical issues that you should think about first. The physical size, noise, and heat generated by a standard enterprise-grade server can be a problem for most people running a Plex server in their house. If you are looking for recommendations on an enterprise-grade server that will be addressed in a later video, for now, this video will cover desktop-grade hardware that's both practical to run in your home and powerful enough to have the performance you'll want, and it won't hurt your wallet too much. Next, you should determine the total number of transcodes you might require. If you're running this inside your home and will only have a few devices connecting at any given time, and those devices can direct play most of your media, you should stick to the small server size recommendations. Otherwise, figure out the number of devices that might be transcoding at any given time and save that number for later. While you can run a Plex media server on practically any physical device from Raspberry Pis to NASes, you'll probably grow out of some of the smaller and cheaper options like a Raspberry Pi fairly quickly. I would recommend sizing your first server appropriately to avoid unnecessary costs down the road. Unless you know for certain that all of your devices can direct play all of your media, I would stay away from trying to run a Plex server on a Raspberry Pi. We will be leveraging Plex's hardware transcoding capabilities with QuickSync heavily in this video. When selecting a CPU, you should typically avoid anything pre-Haswell generation, as Intel started focusing on quality over speed with QuickSync in Haswell CPU architectures and later. You will also generally find slightly better integrated graphics processors in Xeons that have an iGPU. For the small Plex server build, our recommendation is the T1700 Precision from Dell, which can be found on eBay for around $200 to $300 shipped. You can find a T1700 with an E31265L V3 Xeon for around $230 shipped. With hardware transcoding enabled, this configuration will get you around 6 to 7 H.265 transcodes and 15 to 20 H.264 transcodes. If you can find a T1700 with a 1226 V3 or a 1245 V3 Xeon, those are both very good CPU options. But be aware, not all E3 V3 Xeon Intel chips have QuickSync support and you'll want one that does. If you're wondering which Intel CPUs have QuickSync support, a link can be found in the description below this video. The idle power consumption for these computers is only 25 to 35 watts, so at idle it will only cost you 25 to 30 dollars per year to run this Azure Plex server. Compare that to the typical dual Westmere server that I see most people running, which idles around 250 to 300 watts, that's a savings of $260 per year in power alone. This doesn't even take into account the difficult job of software transcoding streams on a dual Westmere Xeon server and how that will further increase your power costs. I've seen my dual Xeon Westmere server hit 535 watts at full load. This T1700 Dell Precision server will pay for itself in power in the first year of operation, even if you just sat at idle with it. For a medium-sized Plex server, our recommendation is the Dell Precision 3620 or T30 PowerEdge. Both of these can be found on eBay with an E3 1225 V5 CPU for about $350 to $400 shipped. Don't let them pass mark score fool you. The E3 1225 V5 CPU will outperform its Xeon V3 counterpart, and this is due to an upgraded iGPU and something that Passmark doesn't actually test for. This combination should net you around 10 plus H.265 transcodes and easily 25 H.264 transcodes or more, all while consuming 35 to 40 watts at idle depending on your configuration. The final build I will go over today is a custom one. From my testing, it appears you can get some great performance out of the new Coffee Lake or Cabby Lake Intel CPUs due to their new UHD 630i GPU. Here is a list of parts and the associated cost for each of them. This build costs roughly $560 depending on the parts you use and will net you 
14 to 15 H.265 transcodes and 25 plus H.264 transcodes, all while using an extremely small amount of electricity. At full load, you're looking at around 125 watts, and at idle, this Plex server will only consume 31 watts of electricity. I chose this i5-8600K for its powerful UHD 630 integrated GPU and its overclocking capabilities. I have tested this machine with just QuickSync and with a P2000 GPU. With QuickSync, I was able to hit 15 H.265 transcodes and 25 H.264 transcodes fairly easily with room to go. After installing the Quadro P2000, it ended up taking it to 100% utilization at 28 H.265 transcodes, all while only using 50% of the CPU. I would guess you could add a second P2000 to this system and get over 50 H.265 transcodes should you actually want it. You really don't need an i7 here unless you really need the extra couple of transcodes it would net you and you don't see yourself getting a P2000 down the road. Personally, I don't think it's worth it, as this build and its stock configuration is fairly powerful with QuickSync and hardware transcoding enabled. If you want to splurge on an AIO liquid cooler, you'll be able to get this CPU to 4.8 or 5 gigahertz, where it would actually outperform the i7-8700K. The one thing all of these builds have in common is they all have an upgrade path. So long as you purchase a full-size ATX case, or the case you purchase is capable of adding a full-height PCIe card, you can add a Quadro P2000 to any of these computers and get more transcodes than you'll ever need. This won't require any additional power or upgrading your power supply, as I've run the P2000 in computers with 200 watt power supplies, 300 watt power supplies, and I've had no issues whatsoever. With any of these builds, you'll see well over 20 plus H.265 transcodes by adding a P2000. That said, running any of these systems in the stock configuration still gets you quite a few transcodes without any problems whatsoever, all while not adding much to your electricity bill each month. Not to mention, all of these builds run with no noticeable noise, and they won't turn your house into a sauna in the summer. Now let's talk about some issues with QuickSync that I found while I was making this video. The first is that as of September 2018, it doesn't appear Plex supports running both QuickSync and NVIDIA's NVENC hardware transcoding simultaneously. What this means is you can install a video card in a PCI Express port and then enable hardware transcoding in Plex, and it'll use the video card only. It won't use the CPU to do any hardware transcoding, even if the CPU has QuickSync enabled and it could do it. This is very disappointing, as you can enable onboard graphics on most motherboards while using a P2000 and a PCI Express port, but Plex simply won't make use of both simultaneously. That said, from my testing, you can run multiple GPUs and PCI Express ports, and Plex will use them both. I did this with a P2000 and a GTX 980 Ti and got an extra two transcodes in Windows. What this also meant was that when I ran an RX 580 AMD GPU and it maxed out at seven transcodes, the CPU was barely being utilized, but I couldn't load any more transcodes because the GPU was fully utilized. When I tested the RX 580, I was incredibly disappointed with it. I could only ever get 7 H.265 transcodes to go before it would hit a wall. It didn't matter what host I put the card in, they all got about 7 H.265 transcodes before they started buffering, even my shiny new i5-8600K. So what that means is, if you put an RX 580 or an underpowered GPU in a server with a really powerful CPU, like the i5-8600K, you'll end up bottlenecking the system because the GPU is too slow. Another thing I found was sometimes Plex would do software transcoding instead of hardware transcoding with QuickSync, even though hardware transcoding was enabled. It was fairly consistent and more noticeable on older generation Intel CPUs. I'm not sure why it does this, but the only way to force hardware transcoding is to manually stop the playback, cross your fingers, and start it again. This happened in both Ubuntu and Windows 10 Pro. This is very disappointing, and I hope Plex fixes this down the road. Please note, I have not seen the same behavior while using the P2000, or any GPU for that matter. For whatever reason, GPU hardware transcoding works flawlessly. 
One last thing to note, and probably the most important, there seemed to be an issue while hardware transcoding with QuickSync, mostly on older generation processors, where the Plex server process would hang. The process would be running, the transcoder processes would also be running, but nothing would work, and all sessions would infinitely buffer with a spinning circle. I mostly experienced this issue on older pre-Haswell Intel CPUs, but I suspect it might plague all QuickSync enabled Plex servers, maybe just to a lesser degree for newer CPUs. I posted a link below in the description to a Plex forum post that I wrote, and if any of you have experienced this, please comment on my post to help make the devs at Plex aware of this bug so they can fix it. Right now, I see this as a huge setback for anybody that wants to enable hardware transcoding on older Intel QuickSync capable chips. So which of these builds is right for you? Well, here is the too long, didn't watch summarization of this video. The medium build with an E3 1225 V5 Xeon would actually be my personal choice, especially if you wanted to add the P2000 to it down the road. The only reason I went with an i5-8600K was because I wanted to be able to turn it into a gaming computer down the road. While I could do that with the E3, the i5 will ultimately do much better in video games. I also had unique space requirements. I ended up building a custom machine so that I could find a case that was the right form factor to fit in a small server cabinet that I built at home to reduce sound from my servers. That said, I think the E3 V3 or E3 V5 Xeon is the right choice for both power consumption and performance. If you want to put together your own server like me, and you like the built-in M.2 capabilities of the Z370 motherboards, coupled with the ability to pick out your own case, fans, cooler, then you should go with the i5 large build. If you want something cheap and decently fast, but you don't have demanding simultaneous transcoding requirements, the small build will likely work great for most, if not all of you. I think the small build is perfect for most households who also share with a few others. The best part is that it can be had for between two to $300 on eBay. I don't think you'll regret any of the builds I put together today, but please leave comments and let me know what you think. If you really want to lab things up and run VMs on your Plex server, I'll be making a follow-up video with enterprise grade 1U, 2U, and 4U servers in a future video. Please let me know of any other topics you'd like me to cover in the comments below, and I'll try to get to them in future videos. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. You can find us on our website at slothtechtv.com where I will post a complete write-up of this video today with much more technical details. Oh, and one more thing. I'm going to be doing a brief video in the coming days where we will announce our 8TB Western Digital giveaway instructions. Please subscribe so you don't miss that.